Hello and welcome to the identification section of our entry level online Bumblebee training day. First step is to make sure that what you've got is actually a bumblebee. There's a whole load of flying furry things out there. Bumblebees are quite big generally and furry all over. They are great big chunky flying barrel things with the best one in the world. This is not a smooth, sleek aerodynamic thing slipping through the air with the greatest of ease. And because of that, they produce quite a loud, quite a low pitched buzzing noise. There are a lot of hoverflies and that kind of thing which look very much like bees, particularly the ones that mimic bumblebees and look very similar. But they tend to produce quite a high pitched whine. By comparison, bumblebees are a much lower drone. They also have pollen baskets if what you've got is a female. So if you see this great big blob of pollen on the hind legs here, if your mystery bee has got that, it's either a bumblebee or a honeybee. There are other species which carry the pollen dry and that kind of thing, or have yellow patches on the legs which pretend to be pollen baskets. But if it's got an actual blob of pollen in there, it can't be anything else except bumblebee and honeybee. It's important to mention at this point that all of these colours, the yellow, the black, the red here, any white or whatever, all of those colours are just in the hairs. They're not actually on the exoskeleton underneath. So if you were to shave a bumblebee, and please don't shave bumblebees, it will be completely black all over. There aren't bumblebee shavers out, so as I'm aware, but sometimes bumblebees go into honeybee hives and the honeybees pull all the hairs off. And so this is what a bumblebee looks like without any hair. And as you can see, not only is it quite angry, but it's also completely black and shiny and almost impossible to identify without getting it under the microscope, even then it's quite difficult. So towards the end of the year, in uh, July, August, September sort of time in particular, you'll get a lot of very old looking bees that have lost hair, that have faded in the sun, and not all of them will be identifiable. Ultimately, that's fine. We have unknown bumblebee, if you're recording them on Bee Walk, they just get to this sort of level, well, not even quite this bad, but they do get to the stage where you just can't tell what they are reliably without getting a specimen under the microscope. And so there are a whole load of things out there which pretend to be bumblebees for all intents and purposes. Sometimes, as with these two, it's simple mimicry. This one you can see is pretending to be a bumblebee. This one is mimicking a honeybee. Basically, it's because bees can fight back. They've got stings, and that means that anything, small birds, small rodents, that sort of thing, which would eat a small flying insect, will just think twice about eating a bee compared to a fly. And so if you can pretend to be something that can fight back, it buys you at that little extra fraction of a second whilst your robin or your mouse or whatever just weighs up its options. And at the speed some of these hoverflies can move at, they can be yards away and accelerating by the time the bird's made up its mind to eat them. So it's a really quite useful uh, incentive. Sometimes it can be uh, just convergent evolution. We've got this decinid fly up here, Tachina racina. It happens to be big, fat, round and hairy for the same reasons that bumblebees are big, fat, round and hairy. It flies early in the year. It needs to keep warm. That's a good shape and a good idea to be a good way of keeping warm, basically. And sometimes it can be slightly more nefarious. Down here, we've got the common or major bee fly, Bombylius major. And this doesn't actually attack bumblebees, but it does attack solitary bees, and it will lay its eggs in the nests of solitary bees. So it's basically dressed like a generic bee. You can see it's brown and fluffy and quite chunky looking, in order to be able to sneak up into the vicinity of the solitary bee nests without being chased off by enraged parent bees so that it can drop its eggs down their holes in peace. So it doesn't really matter why they come about for our purposes, but there are a whole load of things which look quite bumblebee-like, but with a bit of practice, you get the eye in for them. Sometimes that mimicry can be really quite impressive. We've got our bee on the left here. We've got a hoverfly on the right, and you can see that at first glance, very, very similar. This is a really quite good mimic. Now, if you ask a taxonomist how we would split the bee from the fly, 
they will quite happily tell you that the bee has got four wings and the, uh, the fly over here has got two wings and that's all well and good but it's a bit tricky to count the wings when it's flapping those wings two and a half thousand times a minute so the easiest way in the field generally particularly with these good mimics is to look at the heads bumblebees have reasonably sized eyes but they're kind of in proportion to the rest of the head you can see the eye here the rest of the head here there's quite a lot of head that isn't eye whereas with the bee uh, sorry with the fly over here very visual creatures great big eye not an awful lot of the rest of the head here bumblebees also have got these long tubular antennae which you can see here long tubular mouth parts as well flies have these funny little stumpy antennae by and large there are obviously variations with that because there's a lot of species of fly and this funny little stumpy pad out underneath here again very few flies have long straight extending mouth parts like this so you'll get your eye in quite quickly for this sort of level of detail once you can get a decent view of it once you've done that you will also see that there are slight differences in the way they fly and that kind of thing general shape you can see it's not quite as furry it's got this much thinner abdomen it flies in a slightly more direct way and that kind of thing but when you're first starting particularly the head is the way to go now one thing i'm not going to talk about very much today is size and this is quite unusual obviously size is normally quite an important part of id if you have a mystery bird on your bird feeders with a two meter wingspan you can be fairly happy that it's not a blue tip bumblebees don't really work in that way because you've got the caste system you have queens you have workers you have males there's a lot more variation within each species than there is between the species so you can see this is a queen bumblebee these are her offspring these are her daughters the workers but they're a fraction of her size about a third to even a quarter of the size of the queen who produced them you can see these two certainly think they're the same species but the male at the back here is much much smaller than the new queen that he's mating with here and that's basically because size in bees comes down to nutrition while they're larvae in the nest queens get vast amounts of food they need to they need to have a working reproductive system with loads of eggs they need to have fat stores to survive the winter they need to be bigger just to fit that all in workers are basically fairly short use items so they only last for a couple of weeks as adults their only role is to go out and collect pollen and nectar and bring that back to the nest so they don't need to be as big they don't need to have working reproductive systems they don't need to have fat stores they just need to be basically viable little vans to carry pollen back to the nest from the flowers whereas the queen is a bit more of an articulated lorry by comparison the males a little bit in between they don't need quite the same level of fat store they don't need um, to survive the winter basically but they've got a lot more sensory apparatus they need a working reproductive system because that is the only point of male bumblebees is to find a queen and mate with her and so they tend to come out a little bit bigger than the workers but quite a lot smaller than the queens so size can tell you quite a lot about what role your bee plays within the colony what caste it is it doesn't tell you very much about what species you've actually got now spring is a really good time to get started with bees but you can get started at any point during the flight season Queens in spring are a quite good chance to get familiar with the common species before the workers come out, before there's males, when they still look like they are in the books. And generally the queens in spring don't vary very much. Uh, most of the pictures in books are of queens as well. And certainly in the early spring, they're still fairly fresh and unworn. So you don't need to contend with those sort of problems that I talked about, about bald bees and grey bees and that kind of thing. The queens will be about from late February sort of time right the way through till September October depending on the species but basically any month of the year when you can see bees there's a good chance that some of them will be queens they are the biggest bees that we have in Britain in particular Bombus terrestris the buff-tailed bumblebee great big chunky thing up to about an inch and a half long and these are quite characteristic queen behaviors because the queens need to set up nests then particularly in the spring but also in, in the late summer when they're looking for hibernation sites you will see them flying these low slow zigzags across the ground 
landing to investigate holes in the ground, going in and out of those holes, crawling through vegetation, investigating the bottom of grass tussocks and that kind of thing, looking for somewhere to build a nest, looking for somewhere to spend the winter. You won't see that in anywhere near the same level with any of the other casts because they don't hibernate and they don't set up nests. They'll only be doing that if they've lost where they ought to be going. Workers are generally smaller versions of the queens, so all of the workers are females. When you blow them up side by side, there's not much difference between the queen and the worker, except, we'll say, when you look at the internal structure, the workers don't have the same level of fat reserves or the working reproductive system, but generally they look smaller. There are a couple of exceptions to that. Unfortunately, some of our common species fall into that category. Buff-tailed queens have a buff-coloured tail. White-tailed bumblebee queens have a white tail. It's very straightforward to tell them apart. Unfortunately, workers, both species, have white tails. So they're safest recorded as buff-tail slash white-tail bumblebee worker. You can tell in some cases, particularly once you've had a bit of experience, but generally, if you've got something that looks like this, buff-tail slash white-tail is the safest way to record them because they are very, very difficult. And even experts can't do it reliably all the time. The other species is the early bumblebee. Now, queens look like this. They've got a yellow collar band, they've got a yellow band across the abdomen, and then this little tiny red tail at the back end here. And that's what most of the pictures in books will show you. Unfortunately, a lot of the workers look more like this, with a yellow collar, and then completely dark before you get down to this little red tail at the back end. They don't have that abdominal band, or in some cases it's reduced, but quite often they haven't got any sign of it at all. So hopefully you're now forewarned. If you see a small black bee with a little red tail, it's very likely to be the early bumblebee worker. Then it just looks slightly different to the queens, which is, as I say, what most of the guides will actually show you pictures of. Males are the last of the three casts to come out. They're only really produced in a little burst at the end of each colony. So for some of the early species, things like the early bumblebee, you can see the males from about May, June sort of time. Generally, you have to wait until July, August, or even into September. They tend to have hairy hind... Well, they pretty much always have hairy hind legs because they don't have a foraging role for the nest. They don't have pollen baskets. They generally have more pronounced facial hair, and in many species, four of our eight common species, that hair is yellow. So you can see he's got a yellow moustache here. You see he's got the hairy hind legs. And they also generally appear a little bit more scruffy and fuzzy compared to the females of the same species. So you can see he's got a little tuft of yellow hair here. He's got this much more extravagant bouffant sort of front end more tufts down the back here. So if your bee has got bed hair, if it's got hairy legs and it's got a moustache, particularly if it's not doing anything, you can be pretty happy that it is a male bumblebee and not a female, either queen or a worker. The extent of yellow does vary quite a lot, even within the same species, so it's, you're just looking for the presence of yellow really rather than anything else because this is your fairly classic male white-tailed bumblebee. You can see his yellow moustache here, yellow bands in here, still quite a lot of black. And that is also a male white-tailed bumblebee, but a much more extravagant yellow form of it. You can see he's still got the bands in the same place, but the black is much reduced, both at the back here and across the turgon. Now, cuckoo bumblebees, I talked about these slightly earlier. These are really quite interesting bees. They're actually evolved from the social bumblebees, from the nest-making bumblebee species, but they are now evolved into species which don't bother making their own nests. So these guys tend to come out of overwintering about six weeks or so after their preferred host species. Each of them prefers to take over the nest of uh, one of our common species. So they'll come out around about Easter sort of time. They'll hang about on flowers. 
waiting for a queen bumblebee of their preferred species to fly by. Then they will trail her back to the nest. They'll hang about on the outskirts of the nest for a day or so, a bit longer, picking up the scent of the nest. Because it's dark in the nest, most bumblebee communication is chemical. They sniff each other rather than seeing each other, so they need to pick up the scent. Once they've done that, and once the opportune moment presents itself, when there aren't many workers in the nest, they will come in and basically challenge the host queen, the queen who actually built that nest in the first place, to a duel, and they will fight her to the death. Cuckoo bumblebees have got a thicker exoskeleton and a longer sting, so they've got better armour and better weaponry. They tend to win those duels, they tend to be able to sting the host queen to death, either between the plates of the abdomen or around the neck here where the head fits into the thorax. Once they've done that, the queen cuckoo bumblebee goes on a bit of a rampage around the nest. She will eat any eggs that the host queen has laid recently, sometimes even the young larvae as well. And then she'll lay some eggs of her own. One of her other adaptations is to have ovaries three times the size of a normal bumblebee, so they can lay up to about three dozen eggs in a day. So she does, basically splits out a whole load of eggs, and that's it. That's the extent of her parental care. She'll go off and uh, potentially try and repeat the trick somewhere else. The worker bumblebees in the nest don't really know what's happened. They might notice that the queen is missing, but they are basically programmed just to feed developing larvae. In this case, it just happens that those developing larvae will be those of a different species of the cuckoo. And six weeks, eight weeks later, you'll get a burst of new cuckoo bumblebees coming out of that nest, which will gradually wither away and die. Without a queen, there's no more eggs being laid. There's no more workers coming through. There's no reproductives, no queens, no males coming through. So that nest more or less has failed from the moment that the cuckoo killed the host queen. It just has a zombie-like existence for another couple of months as it staggers on before it finally finishes. So perhaps appropriately, cuckoo bumblebees tend to have a fairly dark and sinister sort of appearance. Females of a lot of the species just have this yellow band near the head and the rest of the bee is quite dark. Don't have pollen baskets because they don't do any actual foraging. So you can see the hind leg here is uh, almost completely hairy. While they'll drink pollen and eat a bit of uh, drink nectar, eat a bit of pollen themselves, they won't actually collect any, they don't bring any back to the nest. Several of the species, particularly in the females, have these really quite dark wing membranes. So particularly when you see them sat on flowers with the wings out slightly, you can see that they're obviously browny black sort of colour rather than uh, clear see-through wing membranes. The red-tailed cuckoo in particular, Bombus repressus, has got almost uh, completely black wings, almost sort of smoked glass sort of appearance. And a lot of species have this sort of notch in the top of the tail. Social species, the top of the tail colour tends to just go straight across. In a lot of the cuckoos, it extends further up the sides of the abdomen than it does at the top. So you get this sort of V-shape, widow's peak, if you like, in the top of the tail here, or sometimes it's a gentle scallop, sometimes it's a V, but there's usually a notch taken out of the top. So with those factors overall, quite dark, dark wing membranes, this notched tail coloration, the hairy hind legs, you can generally be pretty happy that you've got a cuckoo bumblebee, even if you're not sure quite what species. They also tend to have fairly sparse hairs. They've got a shorter season, and the host bumblebees, they aren't out early in the spring. They don't tend to fly late into the autumn, so they just don't need the insulation. And they all have short tongues, so you'll only see them really on open flowers. You won't see them do things like visiting foxgloves because they just can't reach. And as I say, there are six species of cuckoo bumblebees. One of them has a red tail, so it's fairly straightforward to ID. One of them has got a yellow tail. The other four all have white tails. Of those, two of them, Vestalis, Southern Cuckoo, and Gypsy Cuckoo, Bombus Behemicus, down here, have got these yellow patches on either side of the front of the tail. So you can see they've got the white tail with the yellow sort of rim bit here. Those two are very difficult to tell apart without a specimen. And the other two are white-tailed bumblebees without any yellow in the tail. You can see Bombus barbatellus, barbet's cuckoo, and Bombus sylvestris, the forest cuckoo, 
Sylvester is by far the more common of the two. But these are all found fairly widely across the country, more or less wherever you find the big eight, the common species, there's a good chance that you'll get the cuckoos later in the year as well. So it's well worth keeping an eye out for them. But you tend not to see very many at the time. Obviously, you don't have hundreds of workers in each nest. You have maybe a couple of dozen of these coming out at any one time. So widespread, but never massively abundant. Now, moving on to the species specific ID bits. We're not going to go into too much detail on the anatomical terms and that sort of thing, as long as you can cope with these. So the thorax, the middle section of the bee, where the wings and the legs are attached and all the muscles are, the abdomen at the back with the digestive and reproductive systems, the sting, if it's a female, coming out of the back end of there, the pollen basket on the hind leg here, the legs themselves, the wings obviously up here, and the antennae on the front of the bee here. As long as you can cope with those, then we'll be okay for the rest of this. So you find your mystery bumblebee sitting on a flower and you're not quite sure what it is. There is a bit of a triage, a system of which bit to look at first, which bit to make sure that you get photographed first in order to have the best chance of being able to identify it. Firstly, tail colour. Next, it's banding, if it's got any, where those bands are. Facial hair, mostly to help tell whether it's a male or a female. The legs, again, mostly whether or not it's got a pollen basket. The antennae can tell you useful things if it's difficult in the field. And then lastly, behaviour. Behaviour is in brackets here because it's not conclusive in a way that the morphological features are, but it can be quite a useful guide as to whether you're likely to at least have a male or a female, whether you've got a cuckoo or a social bumblebee, it's a useful thing just to bear in mind as well, basically. But it's at the bottom and it's in brackets because it's not conclusive. So tail colour, to start with exactly that, just whether or not it's red or it's white or it's yellow or a buff, but not just the actual colour itself, also the extent and position of that coloration. So this is an early bumblebee. You can see it's got a red tail, just about. It's a sort of washed out orange. And it's only really that last section of the abdomen. It's a very, very small tail tip that you can see there. By contrast, this is the red-tailed bumblebee, Bombus lapidarius. Much more intense red there, much more sort of orangey fire engine red that we've got going on here. And a much larger extent of tail. So in the early bumblebee here, it's only really this last section. In the red-tailed bumblebee, it's much more extensive, up to about half the abdomen can be red in these guys. But even that pales into insignificance compared to Bombus monticular, the bilberry bumblebee, which as you can see, can be almost entirely, the abdomen is bright red. Uh, it's usually about two thirds to three quarters. And there's a bit of yellow, a bit of black at the front. But again, this much brighter, more extensive red compared to either of these two really. So it can be really quite useful just to bear in mind that there's more to tail than just the colour. The next most important, particularly for the white-tailed bumblebees, is the banding. And because there are 14 species of bumblebee which have got white tails in Britain, it tends to be quite useful for those. If you haven't really got any bands, you might have a little bit at the top of the tail here, these patches, but if you've only got one band, this collar band, you're likely to have a cuckoo. Alternatively, you can have the two banded group and the three banded group. So the two banded group, we've got a collar and then a band across the middle of the abdomen. The three banded group, we have front and back of the thorax, and then a band, a third band at the very front of the abdomen here before we get down to the white of the tail. So it's how many bands there are and what position, particularly that hindmost band is in. But also the strength of the banding. This is particularly with male bumblebees where the extent of yellow can vary quite a lot. This is a diagram of a male red-tailed bumblebee, which you can see just about shows there's some yellow there. In life, it can be much more extensive. You can see the yellow extends forward over the head as well. So it's worth just bearing in mind the fact that 
these bumblebees can vary, particularly in males and cuckoos. And so the strength of the banding may not exactly match what you're seeing in the book. Moving down our list of importance, faces, it's always quite useful to know whether your bee is a male or a female, not just because you might be about to pick it up, but also because obviously there's different patterns. Bumblebees are sexually dimorphic, the males look different to the females. If you know you've got a male or you know you've got a female, then life is much easier because it cuts out half the possible options. Now, bumblebee faces and the hair colour on bumblebee faces sounds quite difficult. In actual fact, it's not as hard as it sounds, particularly once you've had a bit of practice. This is a female red-tailed bumblebee. You can see her face here is black, not particularly hairy. By contrast, the male of that same species, even from a not particularly good picture, you can see it's got much more extensive yellow on the face. It's got this big moustache sticking out, very obviously a yellow moustache. If it's got a moustache, got a really hairy face, it's likely to be a male. If it doesn't, if it's got a fairly hairless face, then it's very likely to be a female bumblebee, be that a queen or a worker. And as we saw before, males of four of the eight commonest species have yellow faces, whereas the females of those same species have black faces. That's the early heath, red-tailed and white-tailed bumblebees. Face shape can be useful for separating some species, but it's not something that you need to pay attention to for all the bumblebees. And I'll cover which species those are actually important for when I get to those individual species profiles. Legs, again, moving down our list. It's quite useful to be able to tell whether what you've got is a social bumblebee or a cuckoo. Cuckoos and male bumblebees don't collect pollen. So they will never have pollen on the hind legs in great big blobs like this. If your bee has got any pollen stored on those hind legs here, it has to be a queen or a worker of one of those social species. So immediately it cuts out the six cuckoos, it cuts out males of these 18 species as well, and you know where to start looking. The actual colour of the pollen itself doesn't tell you anything about the bee, just what it's been foraging on. And they can be from white through yellow, orange, or even into purple, black, bright red, bright pink. It just tells you what the bee has actually been foraging on recently. That gets a little bit tricky when the bee isn't actually carrying pollen, because you need to then look for the presence or absence of a pollen basket to see whether it could carry pollen if it wanted to. Up here, this is the theory of what you're looking at. So a social bumblebee female, we've got this polished hind leg surface, completely clear of hairs, just these long fringing hairs on the side. Males have got hairs on the face and nowhere near as much fringing hairs. And then the cuckoos, whether it's female or a male, they aren't anywhere near as flattened and they're much hairier. So this is Bombus terrestris, buff tailed bumblebee, queen. And if we zoom in on that, you can see really nice clean smooth hind leg here very obviously flattened it's not a round cylindrical leg it's obviously been flattened out at the end here we can see these long fringing hairs on either side which form the sides of that basket you can see it's really well adapted to carry pollen and then have it scraped off into a collection pot once it gets back to the nest by contrast this is a male of the same species bombus terrestris again even at this sort of scale, you can see that this is not the same on the hind leg here. You can see these hairs. And if we zoom in, you can see, although it's got some fringing hairs here, it's also got all of these hairs down the face of the leg, got lumps and bumps all over the face of the leg. It's clearly different between these two. It's nowhere near as well adapted to being able to pack the pollen onto it and then scrape it off. And if we zoom in on the theory, so our social female, social male, cuckoo female, cuckoo male. These are the two we've already seen with this nice smooth face of the leg here, fringing hairs on either side for the social female. By contrast, this is a male, a lot more extravagantly hairy all over. And if we add in the cuckoo equivalent, this is a female cuckoo. You can see it's got hair all the way down the face of the leg here. Nowhere near the same amount of fringing hairs on either side. Very obviously, 
not able to carry pollen on that hind leg in the same way. And the male, it's just a normal leg, basically. It's got hairs all the way around it, hairs on the face, same length as the ones on the side. No way to carry pollen on that. You compare these, there's just no comparison. Antennae tells you very similar things and isn't really a field character because what you're looking for is essentially the number of sections in the antennae. Females have 12 section antennae, males have 13. When you zoom in on both of them, you can see how difficult it is to tell in the field if you are actually counting the sections. But in general, if you start in the spring, you go out and look at your bees, you're only going to see females for those first few months. You'll get your mental image, your search image of what these bees actually look like. When the males start appearing, they will look different. They look more front heavy, basically, because they've got that extra section. Although it's fairly small overall, it does change the appearance of the bee and they just look different enough that you can tell there's there's something weird going on, and that's when they repay closer investigation. You can only really count them with a really good photo. You can probably just about do it from this one, or with a specimen under the microscope. But as I say, that, that change in appearance is something that you will start to pick up once you've had a bit of practice. Behaviour, bottom of our list, but it is quite useful for at least thinking about what you might have. And particularly for separating male and female social bumblebees and the cuckoos. Because if you've got a female social bumblebee, either a queen or a worker, then it will pretty much always just be working. So it won't be hanging around for you to take pictures of it. It'll be zipping flower, 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 back to the nest, back out, flower, 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 repeat, dawn to dusk. Queens also have a suite of queen behaviours, low zigzag flights, looking for nest sites, landing to investigate holes in the ground, investigate grass tussocks and that sort of thing. The others just won't do those. So if your bee looks like it's lost a contact lens, definitely zigging zagging around, it will almost certainly be a queen bumblebee. If it is sitting on a flower, not doing very much, just hanging around, drinking a bit of nectar, maybe lazily waving a leg at you as you uh, try and take pictures. And if it stays there whilst you take picture after picture after picture and all sorts of different angles and that sort of thing, it's likely to be either a cuckoo bumblebee or a male of one of the social species, basically because they haven't got anything better to be doing. They don't do foraging. They will just hang around looking for a queen to mate with or in the case of a female cuckoo, a queen to kill. So generally, if you get a lot of photos of it, it's likely to be either a cuckoo or a male, or in the case of these guys, both, they are male cuckoos. So moving on to our more species specific ID features, there are eight common widespread abundant species of bumblebee across pretty much all of Britain. Pretty much wherever you are, whether you're in a garden, in a park, on farmland, or on really nice high quality flower rich grassland, you will see these guys. These are the big eight. We've got a couple of red tail species, we've got a couple of white tail species, four in all, plus a ginger one and the tree bumblebee. And bumblebees in Britain fall quite neatly into colour pattern groups, crossed with how scarce or common they are. So the ginger bees, things like the common carder, which are ginger all over, there's one common species, there's three quite rare species, you tend to have to go to them rather than wait in your garden for them to turn up, and there's one cuckoo species, which sits in that group as well, which, as I said before, when you talked about cuckoos in more detail, they are more or less everywhere you'll find the host, but in really quite low levels of abundance. Red-tailed bees, there's two common species, another three rare species, plus one cuckoo, which is increasingly widespread. The white-tailed bees are where it gets difficult. We've got five common species, ones that are everywhere, another four species, which are quite localised or rare, and then four, again, cuckoo species, which can turn up all over the place. So generally, 
These eight species are the ones that will make up about 95, 99% of the bees that you will see on a day-to-day -day basis. And they're what we're going to concentrate on for the rest of today's talk. Um, we do intermediate level training where we go into more detail on these, but uh, that's a separate video. So we'll start off with the ginger or uniform tail bumblebees. One, this is basically a group where the tail tip is the same color as the rest of the abdomen. You can't see an obvious tail. As we saw, we've got one common species of them, one that's everywhere, three scarce and one cuckoo species. We're only doing the common species in this training course, so they're relatively straightforward. This is the common carder, Bombus pascorum. It's quite easy to get to species across most of the country. If it's ginger all over, it's likely to be a common carder. It's quite difficult to work out whether what you've got is a male or a queen or a worker, because they all overlap in size and they're all this same basic coloration of ginger all over. They'll always have some black hairs on the abdomen. You can see them here on this particular example, but it is pretty much everywhere. They're just starting to colonize the outer Hebrides in the last few years. They haven't yet made it to the Shetlands, but everywhere else they are pretty much everywhere you're going to look. The few gaps on this map are more down to lack of records, lack of recorders, lack of people sending in their sightings than they are actual lack of bees. So you can see they aren't actually avoiding the county of Northamptonshire. It's just that there weren't very many records from that county in recent years. Similarly with the top end of Devon here or the remote parts of the Welsh mountains, there just aren't very many people going out to those areas to record bumblebees. Generally, you've got this nice ginger brown top to the thorax with cream sides and ginger and black, not always striped, but a bit of mixed in on the abdomen. There are a couple of rarer species if you're down in uh, the south of England or up in northern Scotland, they tend to have more yellow sides to the thorax. And sometimes they go as far as this, this is really obviously black bands on the abdomen, but you can see it's still got this ginger on the tail here. You've still got the cream sides to the thorax. So although it does look quite like a tree bumblebee, you can still tell that it's not hasn't got that white tail of a tree bumblebee. It's still ginger at the back here. And otherwise it just looks like a dark form of the common carder. Our second group are the red tail bumblebees. They're twice as hard as the gingers because there's, a, there's two species that are common. So two common species of red-tailed bumblebee, three scarce species, localized ones, and one cuckoo. So the two that we're going to talk about here, the common ones are the early bumblebee, Bombus praetorum, and the red-tailed bumblebee, Bombus lapidarius. Now you can see both of them are pretty widespread all over the place. Red tail is gradually filling in these gaps here. Um, quite distinctive species both of them. We'll start with the early bumblebee because it comes out earlier than the red tail. This is the only common bumblebee where the queens and the workers have yellow stripes and a red tail. So both of them you can see have this yellow collar band. Queens and a lot of the illustrations in books will show this obvious yellow abdominal band. So we've got a queen here you can see she's got this two yellow bands nicely shown. Workers often lose that band, as I talked about before, quite often look like this. So you can see there's a little hint of yellow under there, but basically you've got a yellow collar band and then it's quite dark all the way until you get back to the tail here. This species has a particularly small tail. It tends to be quite a washed out orangey colour. As you can see here, this is uh, clearly not bright red in the way that you might expect, and even not as red as the queen or indeed the male here. And males really make up for the workers losing yellow by packing on as much yellow as they can possibly get. So you've got the same basic pattern. You've got a yellow collar band, you've got a yellow abdominal band, but you can see this yellow collar band is much broader across the top here. It extends forward down the face until you've got this big yellow moustache that you can see here. Great big fluffy yellow band front of the abdomen here. Um, Quite a small species in general, but really, really quite fluffy, particularly in the males. And got this obvious yellow face. 
it's quite an early species so you'll start seeing these males from about may onwards and the species in general is almost completely gone by certainly the middle of july it's a real spring specialist and you can see it's doing quite well it's all over the place um but only really in the first half of the year so that's certainly the first half of the flight season by contrast the red-tailed bumblebee much bigger quite later species so it doesn't really get going until june you'll see queens before that but it takes quite a long while between the queens appearing and the workers starting to appear both queens and workers look like this really really smart looking bee jet black plush velvety looking appearance with no hairs out of place big bright red tail at the back end here bright sort of fire engine red tomato soup sort of red usually up to about half the abdomen and neither of them have any yellow on them at all just this completely jet black with bright red back end the male is noticeably different there's noticeably more yellow but although it's got the yellow face it's got the yellow collar band in a similar fashion to uh, the early bumblebee it doesn't have anywhere near as much yellow on the back end it's got a little bit of yellow on the back of the thorax but it doesn't have any yellow on the abdomen here so noticeably different if you flip between the two early bumblebee bright yellow in the males very very fluffy in lapidarius the red-tailed bumblebee much more restrained sort of species still got this yellow face still got the yellow hair there but nowhere near as much yellow on the rest of it and it's nowhere near as fluffy this is a species which particularly in the male seems to fade really really quickly so although when they first come out and they're fresh you see them looking like this with yellow front end bright black in the middle here and then the bright red back end it really doesn't take very long before this yellow fades to white the black fades to a sort of chocolate brown color and the tail fades through orange and then yellow and then eventually to white as well and if you're out around august bank holiday sort of weekend you'll see some absolute wrecks of male red tail bumblebees just ghost bee sort of thing brown and black and not much in between and if you're out on sort of august bank holiday sort of weekend timing you'll see some real wrecks of red tail bumblebees with white and brown as opposed to this nice rich color scheme that you see on this nice fresh one they're all over the place again fade out quite a lot as you go further north you don't seem to get them up on the high moors here particularly but um, they are spreading out along the coast and spreading up this side as well slightly under recorded so well worth keeping an eye out for anywhere you go basically our remaining group are the white-tailed bumblebees there are a lot of white-tailed bumblebees about 14 in britain five of them being common and widespread everywhere so what we tend to do within the trust at least is to break down the broader group of white-tailed bumblebees into their banding patterns so that they're slightly easier to get to grips with so the first group we're going to look at are the white-tailed bumblebees with two yellow bands across them and within this group there are two common species which we're going to talk about today three scarce or rare species you have to go and seek out and three cuckoo species which um, again are a little bit beyond what we're going to talk about in this video the two common white-tailed bumblebees with two yellow bands are the white-tailed bumblebee bombus lecorum which is actually an aggregate species it has a couple of cryptic species in there as well and the buff-tailed bumblebee bombus terrestris so you can see both of them are pretty widespread the buff tail has actually been spreading out through these areas more recently but both of them you've got a pretty good chance of finding them almost wherever you are we'll start with the buff tail bumblebee because it's the first one to emerge in the year you'll start seeing them in february most years you can see really nice big chunky bee and as a queen it lives up to its name queens have this buff colored tail that you can see here it's obviously not white you can see it's buffish here workers and males you tend to have a lot more white in there to the extent that you can get entirely white tailed workers really quite frequently and quite often in males as well in workers you'll sometimes get what we call the tea stain this band of 
very thin band of yellow hairs between the black of the abdomen and the white of the tail here. If it's got that, you can be pretty happy that it's going to be a buff-tailed bumblebee. And you can get that both in workers and in males. If it doesn't have that, it could be a buff tail, it could be a white tail. It's safest to record as buff slash white tail worker. And as you can see, it's pretty much everywhere. These gaps are mostly down to lack of recorders or lack of records at least, rather than lack of bees. And it is increasingly spreading out. It's turned up in the Outer Hebrides in the last couple of years. It colonized Orkney and the Shetlands a few years before that. It's a bee which is really spreading northwards quite quickly at the moment. And as I say, great big hefty thing. Queens are our biggest bee in Britain, one of our biggest insects. And obvious buff coloured tail, the others trickier. The white tailed bumblebee. This is actually three species. We used to think of it as one species, Bombus lacorum. It turns out when you look at the DNA, you've actually got Bombus lacorum, Bombus magnus, and Bombus cryptarum in there. They are essentially only really identifiable if you look at their DNA. So for the purposes of today, we're just going to lump them all together as the Bombus lacorum complex. This is roughly what you'd expect to see. Queens are a decent sort of size with a completely pure snow white tail. You can see it here. There's no yellow in there at all. You've just got these two yellow bands. With both the buff tail and the white tail bumblebee, you've got this yellow collar band. And then the key thing is that this second band is across the middle of the abdomen. So the abdomen, you've got a band of black, then a band of yellow, then another band of black before you get down to the tail, whether that's white or buff. Workers look very much like smaller versions of the queens. No yellow hairs in the tail. You can't reliably separate them from the white-tailed form of the worker of the buff-tailed bumblebee. So you lump them together. You can do the males. This is a male white-tailed bumblebee. And you can see he's got no yellow hair in the white of the tail. It just goes black and then white. But he has got a yellow moustache. You can see it on the diagram here as well. The amount of yellow can be quite variable between individuals, but they never have any yellow in the tail, and they always have yellow on the face. They are basically the complete opposite of males of the buff-tailed bumblebee, in which species you've got no yellow hair on the face, but you do have yellow in the tail. So the yellow swaps ends between the two species, basically. We have a slightly odd map of the distribution because of the difficulties in identifying whether it's Lucorum or Cryptarum or Magnus. Generally speaking, Lucorum seems to be the one that you get across much of lowland Britain, joined by the other two when you get into the upland areas. So places like Glencoe up here, you've got all three whitetail species flying side by side. It is around in here as well, in which case it's likely to be the actual Lucorum, but we don't really know. Our penultimate group are the white-tailed bumblebees with three or more yellow bands. We've got two common species that we're going to talk about now, two scarce species, which you have to make a bit of a journey to find, and one cuckoo species, which fits into that group as well. So the two common species that we're going to talk about today are the garden bumblebee, Bombus saltorum, and the heath bumblebee, Bombus janellus. As you can see, they're very, very similar in terms of general patterning. You are much more likely to find the garden bumblebee than the heath bumblebee across most of Britain, but you do need to look at the faces if you want to be definite, unfortunately. We'll start with the garden bumblebee because it is more common. So this is quite a big, chunky species, similar in size to the buff-tailed bumblebee but a little bit more uh, elongate, a little bit more finer boned, essentially. And it's got this very, very long face and long tongue. So if you are sat next to foxgloves or delphiniums or nasturtium, that sort of thing, and see a big yellow and black stripy bumblebee turning up and visiting those flowers, there's a very, very good chance that that's going to be a garden bumblebee. It and the common card are the only two common species that will feed on those really long corolla flowers. Although, as you can see from the pictures here, they do also visit uh, other flowers just to confuse matters. 
Males, workers and queens all have the same basic pattern. Yellow collar band at the front of the thorax, yellow band around the back of the thorax, you can see it here, and a third band across the very front of the abdomen, so you can see it on this one here. Compared to the two banded species, this yellow band is pushed forwards. So the abdomen itself just goes yellow and then black and then tail. You don't have what we saw with the two banded groups, which is a black band, then a yellow band, and then a black band. Also, as you can see, if you've got the wings closed when it's sitting on a flower, you get this band at the back of the thorax sticking up like a little yellow Mohican here. So if you can see that when the wings close, again, you can be pretty happy straight from the off that what you've got is a three banded species and is either going to be a garden or a heath bumblebee rather than it being a two banded species and you're looking at buff tail or white tail. It does sometimes produce these melanic individuals with the yellow um, replaced by quite a lot of black hair and even black hair in the tail as well. But very rarely, if ever, does it actually lose all of that um, yellow. You can see it's still got some yellow hairs in all the places you would expect it to have, just not quite as many. And this is, again, all over the place. It never seems to be particularly hugely abundant where you do find it. So um, certainly in the bee walk results, you've got loads and loads of common card, a buff tail bumblebee and that sort of thing. Then right down at the bottom of the big eight, we've got the garden bumblebee. But it's still around, great big chunky thing, very obvious when it is there. But um, it does have a confusion species. The heath bumblebee is another quite widespread species. You can see not quite as widespread, but very, very similar to the garden bumblebee in terms of the general patterning. Again, we've got the yellow collar band, yellow band at the back of the thorax, third yellow band across the front of the abdomen, then a band of black and then the white of the tail. It's got a much shorter tongue, short tongue, short round face. So uh, if you can see that, or if you can see what it's feeding on, again, you can be fairly confident which one you've got. So it feeds on heather and these flat open flowers because it can't physically reach where the nectar is in things like foxgloves. It also tends to be a much smaller species. So there is overlap between the two. The bottom end, the smaller individuals of the garden bumblebee do overlap with the larger individuals of the heath bumblebee. But generally, if you've got a big bee, an inch or more long, it will be the garden bumblebee. If it's below that, it's more likely to be the heath bumblebee. In a male, it's fairly straightforward because males have this yellow face that we've got here, which you never get in the garden bumblebee. Garden bumblebee always has a black face. So males are straightforward. In females, Ideally, you need to see the face to see whether it's got this little round Charlie Brown face or a great long horse face of Hortorum. But you can also look at the hairs fringing the pollen baskets. In the heath bumblebee, this species, these hairs along here are a pinky peachy sort of color. Again, they're black in Hortorum. This is slightly underestimating the distribution, but you can see it really likes the acid areas. You can find it in uh, Cornish heathland here, along the coast through the Devon heath here, uh, into the Dorset heathland, up into the Surrey heathland, into these more acid areas, sandy areas. It is around in here as well, and up on the moors in northern England and in Wales, you find quite big numbers of it, but you don't find very much of it in the industrialised agricultural areas, basically. It is not a farmland species in that sense. This is a slight underestimation as well. This is not the extent of the distribution of the Heath bumblebee. This is the extent of the 2006 Highlands and Islands bumblebee atlas, which did an awful lot of really intensive surveying, but they stopped at the border. So the bee is around here in the mountains around Stirling and that sort of thing as well. It just hasn't been recorded there very frequently. But generally, small fluffy bee, yellow face in males, short tongue, short round face, makes this the heath bumblebee, as opposed to the garden bumblebee, bigger, heftier species, corbicular hairs black, facial hairs black, long face, long tongue. And that lets us move on now to our last bumblebee, last of the big eight, 
This is the group of white-tailed bumblebees with a ginger thorax. There's only one species in Britain. It's common, it's pretty much everywhere. It is, in fact, the tree bumblebee, Bombacypnorum. This is a species which actually turned up new to Britain in 2001, down on the edge of the new forest around here. And as you can see, it's done really, really well in the intervening 20 or so years and is now pretty much everywhere. It started colonising Ireland in the last few years. It's made it up into Scotland six or seven years ago and has since spread out all the way through the central belt, going up the sides in particular along the coast. And it really seems unlikely that it's going to be long before it's um, right up to the north coast of Scotland. And it's a really, really distinctive species. You've got this uh, ginger brown thorax on the top, black underneath, it doesn't have the cream sides of common carder. Then a black abdomen right down to this pure white tail at the back end. There's nothing else with that colour pattern. The only species that you see confused with it sometimes is the common carder. And uh, that never has this white tail, always has cream sides to the thorax. Once you get your eye in, they're really unmistakable. What does cause some confusion is that the tree bumblebee quite often produces these melanic individuals where it's got extra black. And in particular, as you can see here, you get this uh, slightly strange effect on the thorax where you've still got a little bit of ginger obvious in the hairs at the back, sometimes at the front as well, but a lot more extra black hairs in. But it's usually hanging around with an awful lot look like this. You can still see it's got the ginger generally even with the melanics it's fairly straightforward to identify and it is now pretty much everywhere spreading northwards really quite rapidly it mostly seems to be quite a suburban species it nests in a slightly different place it likes to nest in tree hollows and obviously artificial tree hollows like the eaves of your house or bird boxes in your garden are really really good for this thing whereas out in the wider countryside we don't have an awful lot of trees with suitable holes in. So this is a species which you get an awful lot of in suburbia and in towns and cities and that kind of thing. You don't get it quite so much out in the wider countryside, but it's still there and it's a really, really abundant species, particularly in May and June, where you'll see vast numbers on, on things like raspberries and cotoneaster. It's about as close to unmistakable as any of our British bumblebee species. Now, in terms of field kit, you can do plenty of bumblebee surveying just by wandering along and looking at bees as they sit on flowers. But for a few of those trickier individuals, having a net is always quite useful. Anything sold as a butterfly net is going to work for bumblebees, basically. So Watkins and Doncaster, entomological suppliers, do an awful lot of good stuff. But anything that's sold as a butterfly net is likely to do the job. A hand lens, basically a magnifying glass, really quite useful for seeing those smaller features like the facial hair or the hairs around the pollen basket, that kind of thing. Ten times is pretty much all you need. It's a nice combination of having enough magnifying power to see what you need, but also a reasonable depth of field. So the bit that you need to see can actually be in focus at any time. And uh, a sample tube to be able to put your bee into uh, avoid being stung as you try and look at it relevant bits. To make that slightly easier, what we tend to use at the Trust are these queen marking cages. These are used by beekeepers to mark up their honeybee queens. So you've got a little plunger here, wooden plunger, bit of sponge on the end, perspex tube, and then a grid across the end. So you take out the plunger, you put your bee in here, you put the plunger back in, and then you can just gently constrain the bee against the grid. You can hold it in place in order to be able to see the relevant bits. You want to see those hind legs, you want to see the face or whatever. You can do that fairly quickly, minimise the amount of time that you've got your bee in captivity. It's got a bit more airflow because of this grid at the end here, so it's not overheating in direct sun. And then you can just let it go again, point away from face as you release the bee. And as you'll have gathered from going through this, an ID book is really quite handy. And we're very lucky now to be essentially spoilt for choice. You don't have to go back very many years to 
there being a point where no easy access B books were on the market, we've now got four. So as one of the authors, I can thoroughly recommend Bumblebees, an introduction, which is the Bumblebee Conservation Trust Guide to Bumblebees. It's got a whole load of photos and diagrams and all sorts of useful information, that kind of thing, focused around the field identification of bumblebees. Uh, Edwards and Jenner is another very good guide. First one that came out in about 2009, now onto its third edition and has a lot of good stuff in it. If you want to go a little bit more deeply into bumblebee identification, including looking at specimens under the microscope and that sort of thing, then Oliver Priest Jones and Sarah Corbett's book here, The Naturalist Handbook to Bumblebees, is very good. It has nice straightforward keys and a lot of extra information at that sort of detailed level, which isn't necessarily in the other books. Um, not so much a field guide as these two, however. And if you want to go more broad and look at the solitary bees as well, then Steve Falk's Field Guide is, well, the only game in town, basically. It's a really, really good book. The only drawback to it is that Steve has now found several species new to Britain which aren't in that book, but it is by far the best option, uh, particularly when you're just starting out looking at all of the solitary bees as well as the bumblebees and that kind of thing. Again, it's got a lot of keys in. You do need to look down a microscope at your specimens in order to reliably identify a lot of your solitary bees. But if you're really getting into your bees, then this is a really good book to have. And I also include this one. This is a natural history of bumblebees. It's not an ID book, but it has got an awful lot of what I hope is interesting stuff about what the bees do in the nest, what pests and parasites attack them, how they defend themselves against them, how you can garden for bumblebees. And uh, for a tenor, I'd hope it's worthwhile because I wrote it. And that is all of us for today. So thanks for coming and I'll hand you back now.